Uh, okay, well, this is a this will be a fun session, and this is a um, this is talking about a very large survey we conducted last year uh, to to really start to quantify the impact of training, impact of uh, of general awareness of application security on developers, people that don't come to AppSec conferences. And this was in response to what Michael Coates and others have said for a long time, is we don't have numbers. And we'll talk about that and why that's really has been a challenge for all of us, both in the vendor community and the, in, you know, uh, on the enterprise side, consultants, you name it, uh, dev managers. We consistently get asked this question, you know, like, what, what is the impact of? And, you know, I'm going to go spend this money. Can you show me some... And then the bad words come out, re return on investment. And there's really no great answer. So this is what spawned this. Um, okay, that's me, um, application security guy. I've been, uh, I think, at every OWASP AppSec since 2005, whenever that was. One was in New York City where we had roughly less people in the original OWASP AppSec USA than we have here today. Uh, so I've been doing this for a while. I've uh, been a security guy for about 20-plus years, ex-Air Force guy. And uh, I'm a dad right now, so my wife let me come to California. I'm not going to tell her how nice it is in California today. It's gorgeous. What's that? No checking in on Facebook, none of that stuff. No, uh, none at all. It's supposed to be like 30 degrees in Texas today, as a matter of fact. So, yeah, because you know why? Because it's a Monday. It'll be 68 on Wednesday. Okay, uh, <laughs> and that's actually true. It was 72 on Sunday. It's going to be 22 tomorrow, and then it'll be 60 this weekend. Um, so I, I run a company called Denim Group. We're about a 100-person uh, company based in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we focus on application security. Surprisingly enough, uh, one thing that's a little bit different than a lot of the folks in the, in the space, we actually build secure, secure code. We get, we get asked by our clients to go and build secure software, which is surprisingly that happens. And it happens more frequently, lucky for us. But we come in from this space. And we are a vendor that does e-learning and classroom training. So we get asked this question all the time. I've been asked, you know, what is the impact? And, and, I, and then I do like the, the shuffle. I don't have a great answer. So talking to other vendors in this space, talking to buyers, this really kind of was the impetus of this particular presentation. Also, for those that uh, follow Bruce Schneier, back in, I think, March of last year, he did a blog post, and it was ostensibly about security awareness training, but he came out and just said it was worth, worthless, largely worthless, worth, worth, not worth the money, da-da-da, there's other things you can do, and then there was like a back and forth, Ira Winkler responded, other people responded, but, I mean, it was out there, and it was a, a great point, because all of us have been in, through some type of awareness training, Right? In, in, in companies you work with, or HR awareness training. The evil cousin of security awareness training is HR awareness training. And uh, so we've all been through that. You get a little snippet or, you know, the company meeting. And, you know, sometimes you retain it, sometimes you don't. So this was curious to all of us, right? This came out. So at the same time I'm getting these questions, this came out, and it spurred us. So, you know what, let's try to, let's do a best effort to try to quantify this particular issue. And that is essentially the impact of security training on developers. But there's a real big difference. So right off the bat, we, we, we figured out a handful of things that were just shockingly different. Number one, well, first of all, they're the same and they're trying to change behaviors. Uh, you know, one is change the way uh, people uh, act and click on things or not click on things or, you know, or, uh, that, that's, that's one issue. And, and, and at, the, at the same time, um, you know, there's huge differences. And probably the big one with developers, two or three big ones, is number one, they always have the capacity or the political uh, power to say no to things. They always do. Uh, they can always use uh, features and functionality and, and deadlines. Okay, we all know that, right? But the other thing that really jumped out at us is, is we knew some of this in inherently, but the fact that it is much more disruptive. It is. It is. It, it just, you know, an awareness training snippet is going to be by design a 10-minute little activity. Here's an email or an awareness deal or, you know, it's, it's not disruptive. You do, do it in the course of your 8 to 10-hour day or whatever you work. Not so much for developer training. The average class that vendors teach is anywhere from one to two days, instructor-led training in a classroom. That is disruptive. Development managers are loath to pull people in, in, in chunks of 25 off the development line to go do developer training. And, and the same thing is true for e-learning. Uh, most of the blocks of instruction for e-learning vary between two to four hours. Okay, they're smaller, but it's still two to four hours. It's not 15 minutes or five minutes. So across the development team, it's going to have a much bigger impact. So when you go as a security person and say, oh, we want to do some uh, uh, you know, awareness training, it's probably backed up by compliance, 
a regulation, not a big deal, not a big ask. When you go and do this, this is a bigger ask. And the development managers view this as a project or something else I have to count for across the teams. You know, that's an, uh, an hourly hit of maybe hundreds or thousands of hours. So this is that's another one big difference. But at the same time, training is like a feel good thing that everyone does. Right. And it's 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 one of those sacred cows. I think, Jeremiah, you, you talked about it in November in, in AppSec USA. It's 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 something that um, managers are used to. Buyers are used to. Companies are used to. Uh, and, and PCI is used to. Also. So it's part of the PCI DSS is thou shalt do tr secure training for developers and you should measure that. So that, that is a, it's a discrete activity that, that managers, auditors, uh, you know, people understand and can quantify. That's why it's a, a thing that folks do. But there has been virtually no ability to quantify or no, no efforts to quantify whether or not that had a 1% impact on the security of code, a 10%, you know, of all the different activities you can do that are prescriptive, that are good hygiene, what, what, what impact was it? Uh, that became painfully obvious in the background research that we did. So a little bit of background on the, on the project. I'm going to jump ahead here. Uh, we started this, I want to say, last spring, and then we brought on a full-time graduate assistant to help. And if we hadn't had her for six months, we wouldn't have got this done. I mean, it, quickly, I started to appreciate for the first time, uh, maybe second time, Forrester, Gartner, you know, the analyst firms and the, what they do, because this is a lot of work, right? I mean, uh, to, to make it quantitatively interesting and not just an anecdote, it took a lot of work. So we started to do an exhaustive review of, of you know, kind of training background and then also application security impact. And here's what we found. There's virtually nothing out there, of, of certainly nothing academic. Uh, we had professors, that were both CS professors and political science professors helping us because it was a survey, right? You know, and so we go and what we found out is in the enterprise, in most organizations, uh, you know, they don't quantify big HR training activities, period. There's there's a dearth of not not just security or awareness or whatever. How about just activities? So there's, uh, you know, training in general. There's a large scale uh, lack of information about development and training efforts. So, you know, re measurement is 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 rarely found, period, for any training activity. So on top of it, you know, there's just a lack of workforce analytics. And that is particularly, I found out, particularly pronounced the last 10 years with the work, workplace turnover, you know, people running around. Uh, that is absolutely the case. So here's our imperative and here's our change, our, our, our charge to us in the industry. Uh, we had a, a interaction with one of our CISO clients probably about two years ago that still sticks in my head. We did, back when we started the company, a tabletop, like, lunch and learn thing for all the developers. And at the time, it was like 15 developers in this small company. And fast forward five years later, the CISO said, oh, yeah, we brought Denim Group in and we did all this training. And I was like, that was five years ago. And every one of those folks that we trained are not at your company now. We know that. And as a grubby, self-interested contractor slash vendor, I'm, you know, whatever. But the point is, is that they, they did training way back when. And in their mind, they thought, the like, guy kept thinking, oh, I did this. But the reality of it is, is that, you know, number, there's two factors that are really making, that are exacerbating this problem. Number one is obviously the field's growing. Bureau of Labor Statistics says it's growing 30% in the next 10 years. We know that by anecdote. The reality of it is it's even crazier, Right. It's growing across the board. You throw in mobile, throw in cloud. Huge demand of, of, uh, for developers, quantified, multiple sources. The other one that we found is very interesting, and the numbers bear this out, is that turnover within IT is obviously higher. And turnover within software teams is even higher than that. And we went out and found uh, you know, a couple of good surveys, one by the Society of Human Resources that actually quantified that and, and, hi and interviewed 1,000 hiring managers. And they said, oh, yeah. Throughout industry, it's 14 to 15%. That's voluntary and non-voluntary turnover, I found out, as you get fired. Um, but in the software development uh, area, much more voluntary and much higher, which means we're, we're you know, so, so the point here to take away is even if you do a bang-up job in the spring of 2007, can't carry that forward for, for six or seven years. It has to be something, and it has to be not one time. It has to be repeatable. So let's talk about the research uh, itself. So... First of all, one of our things that we tried to do, we thought about, and we just right off the bat said it was too hard to do, is we said, you know, a perfect world, 
we would test coders on, on code snippets, right? You'd, you'd say, hey, whether or not they could look at a code snippet and identify or build secure code and then maybe have some training. And then afterwards, they could either identify more vulnerabilities or write less vulnerable code. One of the two. Like software itself was the best measure. And ultimately, it is the best measure. We all know that. The challenge is when you conduct a survey is you quickly realize logistically that's impossible. Not, not, in, uh, not impossible, but incredibly intensive uh, and, and, and resource intense to get, you know, div given the platforms and the different uh, coding languages and you name it, very difficult. What we found out is get, getting people to fill out questionnaires over six months was also difficult. And we'll talk about that, the things you can learn from how what we learned over the last uh, six to nine months. So we, we th wanted to throw out a few things. We just wanted to assess general awareness, first of all. I mean, we're 10 years into this or whatever, 10 to 12 years into the whole uh, focus of applications. So you're maybe this is more well-known, right? Maybe most developers, line developers, know key concepts better than 10 years ago. Uh, so that was the purpose to measure the impact of training and also kind of a before and after. So we interviewed uh, 600 folks. We'll go through how we did this and the, the uh the specifics. We try to keep it as academically close to real as possible, and we and we'll, I'll kind of articulate where we deviated from that, and and where and some of our challenges that we had, and then we wanted to get as many verticals as we possibly could. Uh, so we looked at uh, you know, a bunch of folks, and we uh, about six hundred. The vast majority, if you look to the right, about two hundred thirty-three classified themselves as software developers. So we weren't going after security folks, we weren't going after auditors, people that classified them as selves as, as software developers. Uh, you know, and that's a self-identification issue right off the bat, right? So then we had a bunch of QA folks, architects, and we had 140, 150 others. Well, we, that that's hit us. It's like, okay. Well, what we found out is 50 of them were considered themselves, call themselves BAs or business analysts. So you could kind of put them in software somewhere in or maybe in the QA or kind of like the junior level software folks, but they were involved with the software process. So that's right off the bat. The vet, we don't have security auditors or security folks in general. Um, we looked at you know, big companies, small companies. We tried to overcome regional bias. We're based in San Antonio, uh, but that, that, that came up as an issue. We'll talk about that. Um, and then the, one of the things we found is the vast majority of people we, um, we interviewed or, or surveyed, excuse me, were over, uh, had over seven years. And that, that just jumped out at me. So here's one thing that we learned in surveying is you can't throw out anecdote. Well, I heard this from a political science professor. If you have uh, two anecdotes, that, then, you're, then you have data. You know, if you have one anecdote, that's nothing. Two anecdotes, and now you have data. It's kind of a, a surveyor's joke, apparently. Uh, but so one thing that was very interesting about this is uh, yours truly had done a, a training class for a lar very large government, state government entity back in May. I went in, and I won't say which state or which, which entity, but about 60 developers, I was the youngest person in the room, and I'm 48. And I'm, that's not young, right? It just it wasn't, well, I was young, but, but I was the youngest person, in the, and it shocked me. So the software developers in the public sector by far are much older, maybe double the age of software developers. And double the age, they are. So here's the other interesting, that's good or bad. I don't know if it, if it is, it just is, right? Uh, the other thing that was a shocker is we're based in Texas. So what do we have an overrepresentation of? Energy and oil and gas firms. Guess how old those folks are? When I say, excuse me, senior, more senior. They're also much more senior than our company. Our average age of our developers is probably 24, 25. If you go to any startup anywhere, it's probably 24, 25. But, you know, like in these big companies and big state agencies, it's more like 45 and up. So uh, right off the bat, sample bias. So I'll just say that. Um, so uh, there you go. And then the other thing we wanted to find out is, hey, have you had any uh, training before, any application security training? So we broadly define that. We found a lot of, you know, a majority didn't, but a lot of people had. And what's shocking is about 95 had had more than three days. Now, we're about three quarters of the way through this survey. We realized, wow, we wish we had asked how long ago they had had that training, right? It's another mistake. So, uh, but, but that's something that's good to know, right? And we didn't ask whether or not they had done well in the training or whether or not they had passed the training. It was just whether or not they had a training. So that was a broad um, thing. So the other thing I would just mention, another, I'll, I'll repeat this, is with the lack of survey information, background research in the field at all, 
we quickly realized, wow, this is a, a you know solid survey, but it is really the start. I mean, like there, there's much more uh, opportunity to dig deep into this data and to collect more data. Okay, so here's how we did it. So again, we couldn't do code snippets. That was too hard or logistically too difficult or we have to have somebody interpreting you know, the answers and all that. So what we ended up doing is we took 15 questions that we felt were representative, that if you took these, you, would, you could either do two things, demonstrate that you knew awareness of application security concepts, or number two, you knew the prescriptive side. So I'll, sh I'll show you the examples of questions, but some were like, do you know what a cross-site scripting error is? Number two, do you know how to fix it? You know, so some of the more prescriptive sides. Uh, we targeted software developers, I mentioned, although there was a lot of self-selection bias and people called themselves things. And I think if we had had a ch chance to go back to the 150 others, we probably could have put those in one of the other camps. But we had software developers, architects, and then uh, who are generally more senior by, the, by definition, and then QA people who largely were more junior. We're going to come back to that in a second. Uh, so we, we delivered it three ways. The first way we had was we had um, hard copy, which is old school, but we did instructor-led training for three different classes. We had about 75 to 80 folks that went through these classes. We got to do, and Dan Cornell, who many of you guys know, did the two of the classes. So you got to, you know, throw them out there before, you know, okay, and then afterwards got them. Uh, two-day classes, two-day classes on AppSec security on application security. So that was about 75, 80. The rest were mostly survey monkey. And, and we tried to get companies that were right when they were doing application security uh, initiatives or training, right? So we wanted to do it before and after. We wanted to, uh, in order to capture that, you have to have some kind of, you know, before state training and then after state. So that was a timing issue that was a challenge. And the, thir thir the last thing we did was social media. And put this out on Facebook and Twitter, and we threw some uh, incentives out there. That got us a broader set of folks and, and overcame a little bit of the geographic bi bias. But as you'll see, I mean, like, like most professors will say, that's, you know, not, not Reuters. I'm not going to quit my day job and go work for Reuters or for one of the survey firms or anything like that. Okay, here are three big hypotheses. Number one, that most developers still don't have a basic concept. We felt that that was the case, right, in a broad sense. And the second one was that, in fact, uh, this training might have an impact, a positive impact by some number. We thought, we hoped, as a vendor that does this stuff, we sure as heck didn't want it to be the other way, right? There was a risk when we did this that it could, in fact, have a negative impact. Um, and then we also thought uh, that maybe there are certain industries, like the financial, particularly financial, that might have a, a better head start. And the reason for that is because they're highly regulated, they're probably PCI, they're doing training, that maybe they had a better start, uh, Okay, I talked about the sample questions. So we had two types. Here's two examples of the awareness, high-level awareness. And there was a couple that we looked at after we got the answers back that we also realized they were just not great questions. Um, the one that was like, what's threat modeling? And I think 28% of the people got that right. You know, so it was like, it was, I went back and looked at the answers. The answers were pretty kind of ambiguous. So there's a few bad questions. Um, here's examples of the prescriptive stuff that like, and again, a difference of awareness of what the problem is versus how to fix it, right? So we had uh, 15 questions, about nine of them were awareness and six were prescriptive. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into the results. Again, had a full-time uh, graduate student working on this. Uh, we underestimated the amount of energy it took to capture this stuff. I'll just say that right off the front. Incredible amount of energy to reach out to individuals, companies, on Facebook. We were desperate because uh, I, ironically, I think I put in the title for this a long time ago when I was putting in, hey, we have about a thousand developers and it was impossible to get it. I mean, it was, it would, I would have to quit my day job to do that. But we got enough and we, we passed enough uh, uh, peer review on this that we felt pretty good about some of the results. And here's a handful of them. Okay, so uh, we'll go through. This is probably the one that jumped out at us as a, as a, as a uh, first starting point, and that is um, the QA folks consistently across the answers uh, scored less well than their architects and uh, software developer peers, if you could call them peers. This is interesting because for two things, two reasons. A lot of organizations, including ours, put their junior developers into QA roles to get them started, right? So the average... Uh, not age, but the average a, a length of experience in the, the QA uh, group is lower, right? But where does software security reside in certain organizations? In many organizations, it's in the QA branch. So this is a challenge right off the bat. This is something that we didn't expect. It wasn't in our, one of our hypotheses, 
but it did jump out at us throughout the process that the QA folks consistently tested under tested versus everybody else. However, we rely on QA to have some material role in the application security process. So finding number one. Uh, finding number two was this, this gap between the awareness and the prescriptions, pres prescriptive stuff. Now, across the board, they did pretty well, in some instances, very well about what a cross-site scripting area is. They knew the general awareness issues of application security. But almost to each question, they bombed the how to fix questions. That's an important point. So they, at least they, they're aware, they're more aware than what we thought, but their ability to fix. Now, if you go back to Michael Coates' question and, and remarks early in the morning about, you know, hey, you know, we need to, this needs to be in either in the framework and we need to make this in the library, there's still going to be some level of discretion that developers have. So the good news is, is that um, on, on, on the cross-site scripting is probably the example that is much more of a, key, a keyboard error or input error than, 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 than a huge architectural problem. But this is a great, this is something that jumped up, up at us very quickly. Uh, and when we do a subsequent version of this, we're going to drill down and even have more specific questions around this area. But that was the gap between knowing what it is and what it, how to fix it was substantial. Um, the other one is uh, same, same. So uh, input, uh, people knew what input validation was. So they kind of knew uh, some awareness about session ID. Um, and here's the other big one. We did have, there was an impact. Let's talk about this for a second. Um, that we, we, again, this is across all, all developers, all architects, all QA, is that it was about a 25% bump between the two. Now, let me talk about that for a second. We surveyed 600 folks. We ended up using 450 uh, responses. We threw out 150. Why did we throw out 150? Because they didn't finish all of them. Uh, you know, call it sample fatigue, survey fatigue, whatever the heck you want to call it. In uh, in uh, political sciences, scientists call it ballot fatigue. You know, we vote for the president, the senator, and then the, all the judges, and they don't care about that. You just you know, ah, okay. Um, so here's one of our projects that we're going to do next this year, working on is going and looking at all the different wrong answers or the incompletes. So one of the uh, things that we've already identified is many of those wrong uh, people that were incomplete filled out questions that are left questions that they didn't know the answer to. If you were to count those as all wrong, then the answer, then this is even more dramatic. So that's one of the things that we were going to do is, is go look at that. So 150, oh, that's a lot that didn't fill out one or two questions. They just didn't do it. Uh, so that's a big, so uh, uh, out of the 600 that we surveyed, 100, 450 that we used, the amount of folks that we were able to use the before and after was about 100. Again, uh, and that was probably over six or seven different uh, verticals. It was solid, but not, it's still a lot, very lumpy and probably overrepresented by more senior folks. That's a nice way to put it. Uh, looking back there, the old, older folks. Uh, so the, uh, the point is, is that if we were to get a, a, this is, I think the, anecdotally, I think the results would be much more dramatic. If we throw out some of our public sector folks are overrepresented, some of the energy guys are probably not on the bleeding edge of development. I think these numbers get better, actually. And again, uh, from a political science and a science, social science standpoint, you can't, you can't ignore anecdote. You can't ignore the fact that when you present to a pu public sector client uh, and all of their developers are over 50, you got to remember that. You can't ignore that. And you have to put the, uh, analyze this through that lens. Okay, so there's some weird uh, results that came through. Um, enterprises of more than 10,000 personnel had the lowest secure coding knowledge, and that, again, could be exacerbated by uh, the, 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 the public sector and the uh, oil and gas guys that we looked at. Uh, I think if you were to even get it more finite uh, to technology, we didn't, like, for example, break out technology companies. Uh, that, that will, and I think we probably had less than 100 represented from technology companies. So, so if you get the numbers down in the tens, it doesn't mean that much. Um, so, uh, the majority of the response had no prior, uh, uh, secure coding, which I don't know if that's surprising, was surprising to us. Um, uh, you throw that through the issue of a lot of new entrants to the marketplace and to the, the development, uh, space. And that, that doesn't seem too scary. Um, this is, this is one that I'm, I feel the least comfortable with and I might actually just totally throw out. And that is, there's no correlation between years of experience and knowledge of secure code, Secure coding. I, I think that's one of those ones where if you uh, we were able to 
to look at subsequent analysis that, that, that there's a story that, tell, that, is, that is untold there. So here's another mistake we made. Um, we should have, we did I think one to two years seniority, two to three, three to four, and then over seven. Like there's, that's a vast area. So we should do seven to 10 and 10 to 15. And I think we can look at some of this stuff a little bit better. Um, the response that had more than three days of AppSec training, we're able to answer more than half the questions correctly. If we added in a subsequent question of when you had that training, maybe this gets more interesting, right? So uh, again, this was a massive effort of uh, 1.5 folks over really six months. And uh, the other thing you realize when you're, uh, when the, the wheels are, are rolling and you're down halfway down the road, you can't like start to ask other questions, right? That's uh, uh, not, not that great. Okay. <laughs> 100% correctly identify where cross site scripting executes after completing training. Okay, there's some, some of these are almost small, interesting or less interesting. Um, number of response to able to correctly identify was application security is okay, that's great. I mean, again, I, 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 what I'm deeply interested in certain aspects of this, and even though it was my, kind of my baby, deeply uncomfortable with some of the results that came back. Where you, like I said, if you throw out the, the no answers, if you go and look at, uh, recategorize the others as software developers, suddenly these numbers change a bit. Okay, so here's, those are the direct things that we learned out of this. We learned a bunch of things indirectly uh, that, that I think that y'all can, you know, take back to where you're working and, and think about, or, or put to work. Um, number one, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that that software developers learn differently than companies teach. Does that make sense? Um, I mentioned earlier that you know teaching and instructional ed training and e learning is a is a is a thing that people enjoy doing, uh, and they they understand and are quantified. Uh, it's formalized. It's easy to checkbox. And, and if your PCI guys come in and P, uh, QSAs come in, they will look and ask you for uh, the record of completeness and who completed it or whatever. Um, it's it's easy to understand. It, uh, and it, it's, it's easy to monitor. But the, what we learned throughout this process is that's not, that's not how software developers learn at all. Like, aside from a four-year degree, which many have, if, um, if not most, but not, not all, um, I mean, how many people went back to go learn Android or went to Android school for two weeks or went to, you know, picked up iOS at iOS Academy for three weeks? I mean, like nobody does. You just learn it, right? You learn it through RSS feeds, through blog feeds. You learn it through just uh, social media. You learn it. I mean, you learn it in bits and spurts. You learn it from peers. You don't learn it by stopping everything. So this, this difference between how AppSec training is delivered and how uh, developers really learn, I think, is a shocking difference. And it also uh, points to what a little bit what Jeff Williams and I think Michael were saying earlier, and that is this issue of, uh, you know, really where it's going to be fixed is in the software side and software development in, in, in real time. The same is the case uh, with training. I mean, if you do the, the, the way, you know, teach the way companies teach, you're not going to be effective. Um, so how did, you know, I mentioned that. How do developers learn? They learn, they learn in an asynchronous way is a nice way to, to put it. Um, so here's the other thing to realize is don't ignore the basics of training. I mean, what I mean by that is uh, if you, the way, that, the way that I've heard it said by doubters of, of formalized training is that it's a tax on developers. You hear that term. It's a, it is a tax on development in developers. They have to go sit through it. It's, nobody learns anything. It's a, it's a drudge activity. Um, that, that very well may be the case, uh, but if you do any activity, it has to be interesting. It has to, you have to take current events. You have to do ref refreshers. So one of our things that we'd like to do afterwards is to look at the time de between time between the uh, test and the time that they uh, they took the training. We did capture the data for the hundred folks that did the before and after. We got their contact data. So that's the other challenge with doing this survey. Uh, Five hundred people didn't want to give us the contact data. Right. So we made that voluntary. We weren't going to force people to do that. And we, we got buy in from employers. We got buy in. But we said, hey, look, we're still going to do this kind of in a in a very soft way if you're interested in the results. So we have the ability for at least 100 to go back and see uh, six months from now how, how well they did. So it, it, the other thing is, is that if it's not relevant to people's performance plans, then, you know, they're going to ignore it. And the, the sophisticated organizations have made that it's such where that, you know, hey, you have to do this and it's part of your MBOs or year end bonus. Um, and then the other thing is, is they do want an RO. Uh, managers always want ROIs. 
and, and that's hard to do. And so hopefully we have some starting the process of quantifying that so that you don't have nothing as an answer. Here's the other thing, uh, human nature deal is incentives absolutely matter. Uh, so I mentioned that we did the classroom training, about 75 to 80 people, captive audience, not, you know, imagine three groups about this size for, for two days. So you get to, you know, you get to be friends and do things. We had 75 uh, fill those out. We had, I think, 35 completed, 35 or 40 of those captive audiences Almost half didn't finish the, the the surveys, and I was stunned. It happened the first time. I was like, "What the hell? We need all these responses." And the guys came back. It's like they came back and they all left, and they didn't finish them. They didn't finish the second part, and it happened three times. So um, same hold held true with the, our survey monkey online. So we ended up doing the social media part where we actually threw Amazon cards and all these different things at it. Guess what happened after that? Everybody filled out everything. Yeah, they, not only did the responses went up, but they feel that we had virtually no half filled out ones after that. Um, so our lesson learned from this to pass on to everybody is if you do anything, there has to be some kind of little tchotchke or something associated. And if you think you're above above all that, then when you go next door to our vendor booth, don't pick anything up. That's all I ask. As uh, so we're we're to some degree we're we're human beings and we're we're Pavlov's dogs or salivate when we see Amazon cards. But the point is, is if you're rolling this out, the sheer absence of any incentives is will actually hurt you. I think. Uh, what's that? It's like fifty bucks. Wow, rich, rich. But the. But the point is, I think that if you don't have these at all and it's viewed as one more pain in the butt thing to do, then you don't be surprised by the results. So particularly if the developers don't report to you. So, again, the conclusions, you know, the big main things were is, um, you know, they still don't understand the concepts. The majority of them failed, about 59 percent, uh, but they did get better. Um, they do understand these concepts 25 percent more. Uh, and the, the, the QA component, I think, was very interesting and, and bears further discussion. So um, where do we go from here after this? I think uh, two or three things. Number one, we, we're going to do this again. Uh, the cycle was the summer uh, and, and through the fall, probably about six months. Uh, if you're interested in this, I would say grab me. Because, I mean, one of the things we realized real quickly is it's hard to get responses. It's bloody hard to do that. And when you get the responses, don't be surprised when they – you know, they don't get filled out all the time. So we were uh, rolling into the fall, you know, just with with two or three or four hundred. And then it kind of fell into place towards the end. But I, there were weeks there where I was actually panicking because, you know, this was a major initiative for ourselves. Um, I think the other thing is uh, I, I would love stories of uh, that take this from the anecdote to more of the quantitative. So if you have more references or other people that are doing cool things to quantify this, this is an area of future study. Um, and uh, with that, I'll wrap up.